fall series. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome and introduce Professor David Forsyth. So Professor Forsyth is a professor and chair in the Department of Computer Science here uh, at UIUC. Uh, he got his bachelor's and master's degree from Witwatersrand Johannesburg in electrical engineering and his PhD and MA from Oxford University. His research interests include computer vision, computer graphics, and machine learning. Uh, he has many interesting publications, and today he's presenting some of his work about computer vision. So before we start, just a quick reminder on how this goes. The presentation goes for 40 minutes, followed by 20 minutes of questions and answers. You can either type your question in the chat box, and we'll ask it on your behalf at the end of the presentation, or you can simply raise your hand and we'll allow you to speak and ask your question yourself. So without any further delay, please, Professor Forsyth, you can start your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Let's just do a sound and vision check. Um, everybody can hear me and see me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about what computer vision can do. Um, the structure of the talk, so I, I like to have these structure slides every now and again in case somebody wakes up and wonders what I'm talking about, then you, you wait for the slide and it will it will tell you. So the, the structure of the talk basically, uh, the computer vision discipline is very strong and very effective, but there are some problems. Um, I will talk about our greatest strengths, which are using data to construct effective and very highly polished features and just how magnificently good we are at image classification, at object detection, and at reconstruction from images. But there are problems. And the, there are, the main problems are intellectual problems, and they're very interesting ones. So a first very deep problem is what does or should computer vision do? The next problem is the rules of machine learning, data set bias and representation, are things that computer vision flagrantly violates all the time and nothing bad happens. So we have, there is something about the rules or something about what we do that needs to be fixed. The machinery we use right now is actually quite mysterious and we need to tame it. It needs to behave in a reasonable engineering fashion. We need to be able to predict what it's going to do and we need to be able to prevent it from doing silly things. And finally, there's a wide range of problems where there isn't much training data and our uh, traditional procedures for dealing with those problems become weak. And then of course there are political issues. So uh, the size of the discipline presents problems of cohesion, dissemination and indoctrination. And there are all sorts of simple tricks that people don't know anymore. And I'll, if time allows, I'll show you a couple. Okay, so vision has historically been extremely strong at the University of Illinois. Um, uh, I am currently the sort of local old guy in vision, um, but my colleague Derek Hoym and Lana Lezevnik in computer science are both very eminent. Uh, I have a relatively new colleague, Alex Schwing in ECE, who works on visual learning and segmentation and GAN models. And then new colleague, an, another new colleague in ECE, Saurabh Gupta, who links visual representations with motion. And then this year, three new colleagues in computer science, Liang Yan Gu, who understands human motion from pictures, Shenlong Wang, who's interested in simulation and vision for autonomous driving, and Yu Zhang Wang, who's learning to detect and classify with very little data. So it's a large, highly visible and very broad group of researchers here. And as you would expect, uh, there's a great deal of influence. So um, Illinois wrote the book, my colleague Jean Ponce was at Illinois when we did our first edition. Now I am here and he's in Paris. Um, the, we wrote books on a bunch of other things and we have a lot of well-known ex-students who are very highly visible in uh, vision and technology. Okay, vision has been growing like Topsy, it's flourishing. So if you look online for a list of the top computer science conferences, which is ranking on conference H index, right? Um, which is sort of a weird thing, but whatever. Uh, the top one by a long way is uh, CVPR, which is a computer vision conference. The third is ECCV, which is a computer vision conference. And the fifth is ICCV, which is also a computer vision conference. Now, this website very often puts the conferences in the wrong places, and citation is a very odd way to rank conferences anyhow. 
but vision really is flourishing. Citation and activity are also apparent in uh, Google Scholars metrics. So uh, the CVPR, the big computer vision conference, now ranks in the top 10 of all publications for citation indices on Google. So it's up there with Nature and the New England Journal of Medicine and Science and The Lancet. Uh, what does that mean? Probably not really very much, except that there is a great deal of excitement and activity. And that excitement and activity is resulting in useful programs and useful products. So I wanna talk a little bit about the things we can do and why there is so much excitement about them. Um, then I'll get into the problems. So we are really, really good at classification. Now classification involves mapping an image to a label. And this is hard to do. And it's hard to do because there are various effects in images that make objects look different under different circumstances. So if you look at an object frontally, it's big, but if it's twisted forward, it gets small, like my hand in the video, um, if that's called foreshortening. If you look at an object from different directions, it looks different and that makes it harder to classify. If you rotate an object, you'll see you can see my thumb here, but if I rotate it like this, you can't. That's called occlusion. And of course, objects like people deform without changing their natural, um, their nature as objects. Nonetheless, we are fantastically good at classifying images. And it boils down, or doing so boils down to a relatively straightforward recipe. We need to ask what makes classification work? And the answer is very good, very detailed feature constructions by what are known as deep networks, trained with a tremendous amount of data. And there is a completely general story here. You build features, and then you decode those features into class or an answer to a question or a sentence or frames or all sorts of other things. So the cat picture goes into what I like to refer to as various neural stuff. And you want to um, uh, think about that as a layer of pattern detectors, followed by another layer of pattern detectors that detects patterns of patterns, followed by another layer of pattern detectors that detects patterns of patterns of patterns. And that goes on for a bit. It might go on for hundreds or even thousands of layers and then outcome scores for different categories. Now I'm uncertain whether my, um, whether the video is blocking, but what those categories say is cat 0.9, uh, dog 0.1 and car 0.1, meaning that this thing thinks the image is an image of a cat. Now that works really well. Here is sort of the figure about uh, classification in computer vision. And you'll notice the most recent year is 2015, and there's a reason. So there is a standard classification problem, uh, ImageNet. You want to get the class of the image into the top five classes that you predict of a thousand classes. In 2010, the top five error rate was about 0.28 or so. And by 2015, it was well below 0 0.05, somewhere around about 0.01. It hasn't gone down much since then, but we've been getting better at training with fewer examples, with more classes and that sort of thing. What that means is we are really good at really hard image classification problems. Now, an important thing to keep in mind is that image classification uh, covers an awful lot of ground. I made it sound as though uh, I was talking about a situation where you stuck a picture in and you've got the label cat out but the thing you get, get out might have extremely complex semantics. Here's an example from Mark Yatska and Luke Zettelmeyer and Ali Fahadi from about four years ago, where the thing you get out is in fact a fairly complicated uh, template with roles that have been filled in. So for the two images on the left, um, the image has been classified as clipping, but the clipping label also says the person who's doing the clipping is a man, uh, the, the thing that's getting clipped is a sheep. They're being clipped with shears. Uh, what's being made is wool and it's happening in a field. And that can be done for jumping and spraying. And you'll notice a completely different clipping next to it where a vet is cutting claws off a dog with a clipper in a room. So this kind of classification produces really very complex semantically deep labels. Here's another example of just how uh, rich the idea of an image label can be. What we're gonna do is instead of 
predicting that there is a cat in the image, we are going to predict which of a set of multiple choices is the correct answer to a question about the image. So there's a picture of a cat there. It says, what is the cat wearing? The correct answer is hat. What is the weather like? Rainy. What surface is this? Clay. What toppings are on the pizza? Mushrooms. This is known as visual question answering. And again, it is essentially a problem about classification. An even more complex form of classification is where the label you produce actually takes the form of an entire sentence describing the image. So here, these can be produced now. It remains remarkably difficult to tell whether a sentence describing an image is right. And you need to keep in mind that there are many different sentences that describe an image that might be right. So evaluation remains a bit sticky, but we can in fact generate sentences describing images rather well. Um, a baby eating a piece of food in his mouth, lousy sentence, correct description of the picture. A young boy eating a piece of cake, actually not right, he's eating ice cream. Uh, uh, those of you with children will be familiar with that particular form of mess, um, but really pretty good. The other pillar of our understanding of vision right now is detection. We are also very good at detecting objects, although probably not as good at detection as at image classification. And the reason is that detection essentially should be thought of as an awful lot of classification. I want to know when I'm doing detection, I not only want to know that the picture is a picture of a person, I want to know where the person is. In this case, a face detector is being applied to a picture of a young Madiba. So the image goes in and rather loosely, here's how detection works. A feature stack computes a description of the image. Another network, which is known as a box proposal network says, I think these boxes, but not these, might have interesting objects in them. That set of boxes is ranked and then some feature stuff happens and those boxes are presented to our old friend a classifier, which says, yes, there's a face in this thing or no, there isn't. Or yes, there's a boat here or no, there isn't. That goes through what's known as non-maximum suppression because we don't want to detect the face twice. And you can see there's a green box here on the face and a blue box. Neither of them are quite correct, but that doesn't mean that there are two faces. We need to get rid of one of them. And then having gotten rid of that, we need to take the other one and adjust it to the right size. That's known as bounding box regression. Both of these are essentially routine activities given enough labeled data. Detection is reliable and it's fun. So I'm gonna show here a movie from a class I've been giving on autonomous vehicles, which has mostly been build various vision systems into autonomous vehicle control. You can see I'm the safety driver in this little gem vehicle, which has been lent to us very kindly by autonomous staff. They're the sort of big makers of autonomous vehicles up in uh, just outside Peoria. And what's gonna happen is It'll drive, the safety driver keeping a close eye on what's going on. A pedestrian will run in front and the pedestrian detector will send a, send a signal for the brake. And the vehicle slams on anchors. Now this is sort of challenge one in the class and it's now a routine thing to build a system like this that works well. There are some issues which we'll see later on. When you know what something is in an image, you can then also figure out its position, orientation and internal state. This area is very highly developed. So I'm showing you an example from Angju Kanazawa and colleagues. Uh, you can see there's a person sitting on the bench. The procedure is not only going to detect the person, but it's also going to adjust the structure of a model of a person so that it lines up with the detected person and it's gonna report the 3D structure of the person. Now you'll notice that the reports aren't super accurate as in it hasn't quite got its feet, his feet right um, it is head is a bit bigger and tilted forward and the like, but basically we know where the person is. And registration can, you can register things that are a bit more uh, abstract than people. So for example, given a sentence describing a picture and a picture, you can find the pieces of sentence and localize pieces of image that correspond to those pieces of sentence. So there's an orange box around the yellow dog there's a yellow box about the beach, there's a blue box around the tennis ball, and a red box on the dog's mouth. This extends to segmenting and labeling scenes. So we now have procedures that for 
reasonable collections of labels, usually somewhere between 14 and 70 labels, each pixel in the image is labeled with, it comes from that. So you can see here, the road has been labeled, the bicycle has been labeled, the person has been labeled, the tree has been labeled, the building has been labeled, there's a car, and there are sky labels and TV monitor labels as well. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the uh, powerful procedures for classification and de detection. I'm now gonna pick up reconstruction. A fact of life is the vast majority of people have two eyes. Um, it doesn't really, well, one can manage with one, but it's often more convenient to have two. And that convenience is because each eye has a slightly different view of the world. So in, in this image, you'll see the left image of the perceived pyramid is slightly different from the right image. And then what I've done is I've put those images on top of each other in the frame called disparity and labeled one right and one left. And that disparity, the difference in appearance between those two frames gives me 3D information. In fact, that 3D information is very rich. So I'm gonna do all of 3D reconstruction in about three slides. So you'll understand that I'm compressing some matters here but essentially cameras work like this. You have a light type box with a very tiny hole in the front. Any light that reaches the sensor, the image plane at the back of the box must come through the hole because it's a light type box. Because the hole is tiny, it can only come from one ray. So on the back of the box is formed an image of the objects out in the world. And you, you can actually build cameras like this. There's a bunch of other stuff that you need to make cameras work a little bit better, but this is essentially what's going on. Okay. Now, imagine I have two of those cameras. What I'm gonna do is see a point in the world, and you can see I have two holes in the front of the cameras. I've suppressed the boxes. I'm gonna see a point in the world in the left image and a point in the world in the right image. In the left image, I'll get two measurements of the position of the point in the world. And in the right image, I'll get two measurements. That should suggest I have more measurements than degrees of freedom, which is correct. I've got four measurements and three degrees of freedom. This means that correspondence is constrained. So there's about, I'm now summarizing about 10 years of the vision literature, but basically correspondence between the left image and the right image is constrained. And if you have enough points, you need at least four and enough pictures, you need at least two, you can recover both the geometry of the points and the relative configuration of the cameras. So I can get both the shape of the world and where the cameras were. This is hugely useful. So I'm gonna show a movie from my colleague, Derek Holmes' company, Reconstruct, where, which uses this idea to inspect uh, infrastructure. Let's see, here we go. These are photographs of a bridge. The bridge is a bit tricky to inspect. The photographs have been obtained by flying a drone. What the reconstruction, the 3D reconstruction, those photographs have been put in place because of the procedures I sketched earlier. And the little frustrums that you see are in fact camera frustrums. So it knows where the drone was when it took the photograph. And even better, you can zoom in on an actual photograph. And because there's a 3D reconstruction lurking in the background, you can draw, say, a line on the photograph. And that gives you a measurement of absolute length. So this thing is telling me that that piece of pipe that was marked up in the video is actually 2.76 meters long. And if I'm interested in knowing how big a rust scar is or how much, uh, how badly concrete has been damaged, that is useful. Now, because we can do that, we can do a variety of other very useful tasks indeed. One is we can build a map of the world and localize, localize ourselves in that map at the same time. This is another highly developed area of reconstruction known as SLAM or simultaneous localization and mapping. Here, uh, what I'm showing is uh, a 3D map from LSD SLAM of a very large world. You'll notice that there are multiple buildings here. This is multiple blocks of buildings at a university. Uh, the robot moves around, it sees pictures of each building, it performs reconstructions, it registers the reconstructions to one another and recovers where it was. And then when it goes back to where it started, the drift in the reconstruction is sufficiently small 
that it can close the loop and know that it's come back to where it started. Uh, these reconstructions now are possible on the scale of a city. The, the biggest obstacle is collecting the data as opposed to doing the reconstruction. You can do this in three dimensions as well. So I showed you earlier a slide where pixels in an image were labeled with their semantics, car, bicycle, building, sky, tree. Now what's going on is laser scans are being labeled with a series of fairly natural labels, which are useful to autonomous vehicles. So man-made terrain, natural terrain, high vegetation, low vegetation, buildings, that's the gray stuff, other hard stuff, and scanning artifacts, which is the red stuff. The nice thing here is you can actually see the little park in green. You can see the paths that people have made in the little park. That's man-made terrain in orange. And you can see um, the trees in blue. You have a labeled 3D map that, that tells you roughly where you can go and where you shouldn't go. And you can do this also by uh, registering to vision reconstructions. In the previous page, that was done with uh, rangefinder data. Here, what's happening is visual reconstructions are being registered to one another. So Sengupta et al. on the left, uh, semantic image segmentation. So they marked uh, labels for patches and images. Um, the color of the label tells you what label it is. So car is purple and so on. Now, what, once we've seen that, we can do, because we've been driving around doing this, we can do 3D reconstruction of where we've been. And you can see on the right, there is a bundle adjustment showing camera centers and 3D points. And that's registered to a Google map. And then what we can do is make a surface reconstruction of where we've been, which is on the left. And then finally, we can paint that surface reconstruction with labels that have been lifted from the images that the car saw. So on the right, you'll see a 3D scene reconstructed and then overlaid on Google Earth. And then uh, each color is the color of, or the, the label seen from that angle. So the road is where the roads are in Google Earth as it should be. The signs are where the signs are. Well, it looks as though there are rather more of them than there should be. There's pavement in the right place. Uh, there is vegetation in the right place. So we can now get extremely rich and sophisticated 3D maps by just driving around and taking pictures. Okay, so having shown some of the successes of the discipline, I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that we need to understand, the big intellectual problems in the discipline. They're very engaging because they're quite easy to state, but they seem to be very difficult to engage. So everything I've shown you comes from what I like to call the belief space about computer vision. It says cat object categories are fixed and we know what they are. Uh, we can get good training data. Uh, object recognition is gonna be K-way classification and detection is gonna be lots of classification. Now there are good reasons to doubt all of these points. There is often very little training data and can be very difficult to get. Uh, objects can belong to more than one category, which is annoying because you don't really know what to call it if it belongs to more than one category. However, what we've inherited from believing that computer vision was like this is a tremendous amount of information about feature constructions. We're really, really good at building image classifiers and a lot of practice of empiricism, which is valuable and it's hard to do right. But we still need to ask, what does vision do? And here are some answers. One possible answer is it lists all the names of all the objects in the picture. Now that is a silly answer. And the reason it's a silly answer is if you look at me uh, in the little inset, you will see on top of the shelf behind me is something that I can't identify right now. Um, oh, it's a bag. And that bag has a strap and the strap has a toggle. There is really no point in listing that toggle. There are tons and tons of objects in every image and most of them don't matter at all. And of course, some objects, we might not even know their names, so we could list their descriptions. But that's not a particularly good idea either because the number of descriptions would be very large. There is very good evidence that vision evokes emotional states in humans, but we don't really know what to do about this. So I'll sort of leave it where it lay. It's, it's an important point, but it's one where right now it's not clear what you can do. Here is another answer. Vision exposes possible futures. What could happen? 
where you could go, who could move close to you, and what, it could, what things could be useful for. So here's an example. This is an interview of a child who's being interviewed for um, early signs of a childhood affliction. It's a, uh, it's a video I can show publicly, and he's going to chat, the interviewer is going to chat to him while he sits in his Hi, mom's lap. Are you ready to play with some new toys? Look at my ball. Let's play ball. Ready, set, go. Okay. Um, how many RJ11 jacks were in the wall near the camera? Now, this is always very tough to do over video, right? With a live audience, everybody looks at me as though I've grown an extra head. Uh, it's just a not, not a sensible question. Uh, I know the answer, but I know because I looked before I asked the question. So whatever you're doing when you watch that sequence, what you're not doing is just counting every object. Here are questions you can answer, and they're really quite good questions. Uh, what is the mother feeling? What is the interviewer feeling? How is the child feeling? Why? Because they tell you what will happen. So uh, let's take another look at the interview. Ready? Okay, what's going to happen? The reason you know about these feelings, you may know about them because you're a good person, but another very good reason you know about these feelings is you want to know what's going to happen. Knowing about those feelings will tell you what will happen next. By the way, what will happen next? Of course, he's going to fling the ball on the floor again. The only question is where, and he does. <laughs> he's a happy camper. Um, how many RJ11 jacks were in the wall near the camera? Now you should notice that I cued you with that question. Most people were gonna guess that I was gonna ask it again, but it's still just not relevant. By the way, the answer I believe is five. And I did that because I checked frame by frame earlier attending to that. Watching the little guy throw the ball around is, is just distracts you. you. You focus on what's important. So vision should predict the future. How, we don't know. So here is a second important intellectual problem. Uh, the rules of machine learning theory are very strong. They're very helpful. But what they say is this. Learning theory bounds generalization when test data is like training data. If your test data is an IID sample from the same distribution that generated your training data, you're in good shape. Otherwise, your mileage may vary. But actually, visual data is immensely variable. It's not clear that you can even talk sense about the probability of an image. If you could, it's probably not very much sense. It's not a topic that lends itself to much in the way of specific analysis. But if such a thing exists, it has very, very long and very, very heavy tails. There are lots and lots of images, all of them different from each other, and all of them different in substantial and interesting ways. Now, this is a major engineering problem because we know that learning theory will uh, guarantee our behavior if we work in within the bounds of the rules, but we don't work within the bounds of the rules. We know that learned systems don't always do what we want, usually because the test data isn't like the training data, but we don't really know what to do about it. So here's one example. Imagine I've built a detector that marks cars. It's not actually enough to use that detector for autonomous driving. Something that only marks cars and misses an otherwise unfamiliar thing because it doesn't know what it's called and hasn't seen it before is going to result in tragedy very quickly, right? So we really, really need to be able to deal with unfamiliar things. The human ability to deal with unfamiliar things is astonishing. I'm going to show you a sequence here, which will show you um, events that are probably unfamiliar to most people on the seminar. Uh, unlike, you're unlikely to have seen this before. You probably won't see it again all that often, although I, I use it very often, but I think I'm the only one. Um, nonetheless, by this stage, even almost, yeah, we're about right. Uh, yeah, you can, tell, you can tell for sure what's happening. Now, even the donkey knows he's peddling his little legs and we're fine. Right? That is not happening because you've seen many versions of this before and are matching to it in your head. Something somewhere is reasoning about stories or about structures or about reasons or about causality and able to interpret an otherwise very unfamiliar scene. 
there are some strategies here, but they're not very satisfactory. One thing you could do is just get a lot of training data so all bases are covered. Collect a couple of hundred movies of people unloading donkey carts and you'll be fine. It's not a very sensible answer. We don't really know how much data you need, when you have enough, and how well it will work when you collect it a lot. And what that means to me at least is just simply connecting vision to action with reinforcement learning is likely a stunt. One needs to think very hard about representation. Um, another, uh, strategy is to, to author representations to manage the learning process so that novel effects aren't a nuisance. So one simple example here, if you represent space in a kitchen in GPS coordinates, you've got real problems because every kitchen is different because they're in different places on the planet. And that means your training data is probably not very helpful. If you represent space in the kitchen in terms of the space that's close to the fridge, the space that's close to the stove, the space that's close to the sink, You've got lots and lots of examples and you might be in very good shape. So understanding how we should represent things may help us with the rules of machine learning. How do the challenge is, how do we make actionable representations from unfamiliar data? That remains a hard, hard challenge. Okay, so the next sort of thing, intellectual problem we have is we need to know how to tame the machinery. We are very good at doing things with deep networks, but they are in fact mysterious. Here is one challenge. I had a question from an audience uh, last year when I gave a version of this talk. And the question was essentially, my neural work network doesn't work as well as I'd like it to. What do I do now? Um, and the answer to the question was, you know, gun ask Jan LeCun, it's his fault. The, we really don't have a body of pragmatic theory that explains how well it should work, how much data is required to make features, how much data is required to get classifiers to behave themselves, and how well things will work on test data, right? In particular, we don't have a body of theory that says, look, I'm in trouble right now, what do I do? Do I collect more data? Do I fool around with my network architecture? Do I do both? That's one challenge. Here's a second challenge. The machinery itself has some very odd features. So on the left, this is from Segedi's paper in 2015. On the left, is a column of images correctly classified. So there, I can't remember, I think it's speakers, praying mantis and dog. On the right is a column of images all labeled ostrich. And the thing that should strike you as being problematic here is the difference between the two isn't apparent. In the middle is a column that shows what you get if you subtract the pixels. So very, very tiny changes in the pixels of the images has caused these images to be completely misclassified. These are known as adversarial examples because the current best way of doing this is to deliberately set out to trip up the classifier. What we don't know is whether there are things in nature that do it accidentally. So there are lots of ways of building adversarial examples. Uh, this is a very nice trick by Shao et al, which says apply flow to the image. Some students of mine put together another very nice trick uh, which said colorize the image. Um, we can build them very easily. And in fact, we can build physical adversarial examples. So this, um, for people who can remember the world in which we left our homes and wandered around, this may even be a familiar scene. Um, you'll see there are two stop signs. One of them is a pretty obvious stop sign. This is the stop sign uh, approaching Siebel Hall. And the other one looks as though it's been messed with. The first one is the stop sign provided by the city of Urbana. The second one, in fact, is one I got on uh, Amazon, and then we adjusted the pattern on it. And what we did to adjust the pattern was we tried to keep it as close to a stop sign as possible, but to make it invisible to stop sign detectors. So the reason we've got two is we're going to run a standard detector, and we're going to see what happens. So he's driving. And in a moment, the detector should pick up the distance stop sign. By the way, this movie displays another feature of detectors, which is they're not that great at small objects. There we go, stop sign, stop sign. This one hasn't been spotted and it will not be spotted. You can see the st students standing there looking nervous. He's been picked up by the cops twice at this point because they wanna know what he's doing with the vandalized stop sign. And he has to explain he got it in Amazon. Okay. Now, what that means is it is possible to build physical objects that may look quite a lot like the real thing to people, 
but fool detectors. And of course that presents real threats for autonomous vehicles. So you can do even funnier tricks if you're willing to fiddle around with the interior of the detector. There's a detector called YOLO, which works a little bit differently from the script I described to you. It uses a wide range of pixels to detect stop signs. And what that means is if you interfere with the pixels in the image, you can actually cause other things to disappear. So here we have an image, the stop sign's been detected and the person on the bench has been detected. We're gonna fiddle with the pixels on the stop sign and erase the person. The detector will not see the person, which is a stunt, but rather a fun one. Challenge, we really need to make this nonsense stop. It needs to be the case that we can prove that we have a robust approach without sacrificing accuracy or speed. Now, the very severe difficulty here is we do know ways to prove that an approach is robust, but they don't work very well and they tend to be slow, meaning you get huge collapses in accuracy for robustness to adversarial examples. Okay. The last uh, thing I want to raise, it looks to me as though we may not have time to talk about uh, scale, let's, let's see. The last thing I want to raise as an intellectual issue is problems where there aren't very much training data. So here's one, um, lane boundary detection. And I put the huh there because every time I talk to students about it or to anybody else, it's seen as a bit of a lowbrow problem. Uh, it's not even in computer vision for autonomous vehicles, which is a very good review recently published by Janai et al. But in fact, it's a very interesting and very important problem. Lane boundaries are practically very important. There's a lot of money in good lane boundary detection procedures. The easy cases are firmly solved, but the hard cases remain very hard. There is an interesting interplay of detection and geometry here that I will show you. So here's a figure from a Google patent on lane boundary detect detection. And this is how the vast majority of systems work on the easy cases. You find the paint, you fit lines or curves to the paint, and then you get on with life. And that actually works extremely well as long as people are looking after the paint properly. Uh, it can get hard. So there are a bunch of things that create serious problems here. One is shadows. You can see uh, the car casting a shadow, quite a deep shadow on the paint, which could disrupt the reflection of the paint. Another is bad weather. You can see the snow is creating problems with the paint and visibility and the like. Curvy roads present very serious problems. This is a sort of dip in the road in the UK. And then of course, there are lots of roads without any paint on them. The best known lane boundary detector is due to Khan et al. Um, came out in 2020. It's state of the art on almost all of the challenges. And it uses a fairly straightforward strategy. You detect key points in an image use, using marked up training data. You basically build a big neural network that detects key points. The key points are marked up. So on the right at the bottom, you can see points marked on the lanes by some patient soul at the other end of Amazon Mechanical Turk, I believe. You then rectify the image from the estimated horizon so that you are working in the ground plane rather than in the frontal plane. That's sort of an established computer vision trick. And then you say on the ground plane, lane boundaries are parallel and they have very simple geometric forms. And you impose that structural model. And that gets very good lane boundary detection. So you can see a uh, markup over here showing boundary detection on a variety of different cases, including cases where there, aren't, where there isn't any paint, uh, where the scene is crowded and where it's nighttime and the boundaries are curved. What is odd about this thing is why you need to mark up data at all. So, the, we know that road looks like itself. We know that paint looks like itself. We know the geometric structure is simple. That should be enough. But we do not currently have methods that can, be, that can deal with unsupervised uh, uh, construction of lane boundaries. Here is another example where there actually now is no data as opposed to very little data. So there is a classical computer vision problem where you decompose an image into albedo and shading where albedo is the fraction of light reflected and shading is the amount of light arriving. The problem with this, of course, is you don't have any real training data. You can get computer graphics generated data, but it turns out to have very serious problems. What I'd like to be able to do is take the image on the top of these two examples and report back something like the albedo at the bottom. You'll notice that all the little shadows have gone and the smooth uh, um, uh, uh, shading gradients have gone. 
It turns out you can do this without any training data. What you do is you make fake data. Uh, it captures spatial statistics of albedo and shading, and then you train a network to decompose the fake data. Now, of course, if you do that, it's gonna decompose real images wrong. So you also have to make it behave on real images. And the way you do that is you use an adversary to say the shading you report for real images should look like fake shading locally. So um, small patches of that shading should be like small patches of fake shading. The albedo that you make should look like fake albedo. So locally, small patches of the fake albedo should look like small patches of the real albedo. And it turns out if you do that, you get very good decompositions into albedo and shading. Here are some qualitative examples. Um, although it thinks that bathroom fittings are a very light shade of pink, which is sort of just not right, it's also knocked out all of the shading uh, on the surface of that thing and reported that everything is white. It's quite good at um, clothing, which has very complicated local shading, which it mostly knocks out. And it's quite good at dark shadows. And wonderfully, the quantitative results are about a point in the right uh, measurement uh, uh, frame better than the current best, which is due to Liu in 2020. So you really can do very well at unsupervised um, uh, intrinsic image decomposition. And in fact, the, there are some other advantages to doing it this way. One of them is that your albedo actually looks like an image albedo. Uh, most state-of-the-art methods do not have that property. And of course, the reason it's good that it looked like an image albedo is if you're going to take that image, the albedo, and then light it in some new way or use a detector on it, you'd like to keep the details. There are tremendous challenges. So if you take this procedure and do with it what I wanted it to do, which is knock out shadows from outdoor images, it doesn't do that. And it doesn't do that in a very annoying way. You will see on the left an image and on the right top an albedo and bottom a shading. And you'll notice that it's kept the shadow. And annoyingly, it's got some of the shadow in the albedo and some of the shadow in the shading. And that should not happen. By the way, that happens for most, to, well, for all modern methods as well. It is not currently known how to deal with that effect. There are shadow detectors, but they're a different matter entirely. And again, the, the same effect on the shadows. So here's my structure. And looking at the time, I think I've hit 40 minutes pretty much dead on. So I will duck the political problems. Uh, the computer vision discipline is very strong and effective. Uh, we have great strengths at constructing features, particularly for classifying images, for detecting things in images, and for reconstructing the 3D world from images. And we have complex intellectual problems that still keep us awake at night. What should vision do? We constantly break the rules of machine learning and nothing bad happens except when it does happen. How do we sort that out? Uh, how do we tame the machinery so that it behaves in a reasonable engineering fashion? We want uh, um, deep networks not to be mysterious artifacts. And how do we deal with problems where there isn't much training data? And I will stop and take questions as that's what we do at this time, I believe. Thank you, Professor. That was a great presentation. Yes, now's the time for questions. And I already have one question in the Q&A. Great. Box. So uh, this is a question from Sichi. Uh, he says, thanks so much for the informative presentation. What's the relationship between the study of human eyes and computer vision algorithm development? Will understanding how human eyes work do a great help in improving computer vision performance? Um, that is a question that's been open um, for about 150 years now. So some of the earliest re algorithmic reasoning dates far before the invention of computer science, and it has to do with human vision problems. There were people in the 19th century basically talking about the algorithms that people used to understand the world. Uh, on and off, there have been close interactions between the uh, human vision community and the computer vision community, uh, each side trying to help the other. The, it is not clear that either side has benefited. I think uh, um, the, the computer vision community, the big benefit the computer vision community has had is, you know, for a long time, it looked as though we couldn't do anything at all. 
And it's nice to deal with somebody who's got an example of a working vision system, right? You don't understand how it works, but at least that's good. Um, for the human vision community, there are some things that have come out of computer vision where people identify things, uh, a visual phenomena that might be useful to human vision. And that I think has you know, been helpful, but mostly there's no evidence that a deep understanding of one is necessary for a deep understanding of the other. Uh, it's probably a very bad idea to study one without paying attention to the other, but th the idea that there is a trick that people have learned on one side that will just transform the other side is, is not easy to support. Um, one more question from Egerman. Egerman, you can open the mic, unmute yourself. Thank you, Professor, for this good presentation. Oh. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I just would like to hear your... Um, sorry, I, I'm having problems with my uh, audio. So um, you probably know that, well, there is a debate of like building building an autonomous vehicles that has a lane detection and like a separate thing does a, like lane detection, a separate thing will does like you steer left, you steer right. And then well, there is this second school of thought in which says that you should use like a generalized neural network to sort of handle all of these things at once. So I just wanted to hear what you think on these two schools of thought. Okay, so, so the first thing I want to say is predicting the future is difficult. Um, at various points, I've made spectacular errors. I remember being shown the first Mosaic browser in the early 90s and wondering why anyone would bother and sort of assuming I'd never see anything more of, about the World Wide Web. And you, you, you can see where that went. Uh, and I heard the first talk at an academic conference that introduced... Um, the Google uh, indexing idea. And I thought that wasn't going anywhere either. It seemed extremely dull to me. So, you know, my ability to spot where things are going is a little bit, a little bit questionable. Uh, um, it's really tough to say what will be useful in engineering and autonomous vehicles. My guess is we're not going to see many autonomous vehicles for urban or suburban driving in uncontrolled circumstances for a long, long time. We'll see them for highway driving and for driving in circumstances where it is possible to have tremendous control of the um, transportation infrastructure. So for example, if you can keep people off the streets and you can keep chickens off the streets and you can control access to the streets and that sort of thing, and you can make sure they're laid out right, that's coming probably fairly soon. When it comes, it's almost certainly going to be less smart than people think. You can do an awful lot of driving by looking at a combination of GPS, LIDAR, and maybe a detector of what's in front of you. Particularly if you have a really good map and you have moderately good visual slam operating. So quite a lot of it is probably fairly stupid. The, the, for me, the difficulty with the argument that says simply connect some sensors to a reinforcement learning system, uh, connect the other end of the reinforcement learning system to the steering and the accelerator, and then essentially smack it every time it does something wrong, but you probably do that in a simulator, is, well, it's twofold. One, it hasn't shown a great deal of success as an engineering enterprise. You can make it work in demonstrations, but rolling it out into product really hasn't had much uh, success. Very often it behaves extremely oddly when you show it things that are even slightly different from what it was trained with. And that's sort of predictable. Reinforcement learning involves learning in a situation where you have really very little data compared to what you're trying to learn. The evidence I think is on si the side of things that produce pretty well understood reconstructions and then interpret them. 
but it's this is an area where it's very easy to be wrong. Thank you, Professor. Sure. And now we have a question from Professor Lewis Lee. Um, professor. Uh, yeah, okay, so here I am. Uh, so I had a question. So I'm an assistant professor in transportation systems. And it seems to me, this is sort of a broad question, but it seems to me that a great deal of the uh, applications of computer vision that we hear about are transportation uh, related. And I don't know if that's just availability bias that maybe I'm a transportation guy, so I notice it, but uh, it's also in the news a lot. Uh, autonomous vehicles, let's say uh, automatic uh, number plate recognition, things like this. Uh, what do you think it is about transportation that makes it so that a lot of the frontier or a lot of the investment is in transportation in particular, as opposed to, you know, off the top of your head, if you were an alien from another planet, you might think of a bunch of different applications across, you know, lots of different fields, but we hear about transportation all the time. Um, I, I can give some answers that there are, uh... I think there's a little bit of, you know, sort of participant bias there in as much as there are other applications we hear about a fair amount. They're usually sort of slightly worrying surveillance applications or um, the stuff in Facebook where, well, sorry, the stuff, the stuff in social media where they're going to tag images and do that sort of thing. Uh, um, the thing that is driving computer vision in some areas and not others is essentially the availability of money doing all this stuff is fantastically expensive, right? Uh, doing this stuff, um, let's see. So transportation also, autonomous cars sound cool to people. It's, it's the kind of thing you can use to annoy uh, um, people who think about social structures. You can use it to look good on telly and the like. Um, I think that's part of it, but I think the main thing is money, right? The, the, for about five years now, maybe a little bit longer, there's been a conviction amongst the community of large car ma manufacturers that one of the big five is going to go out of business as a result of the autonomous vehicles world. And nobody quite knows who it is. And nobody's all that keen to be the last one through the door. Uh, um, so that, that has generated a great deal of money going into these areas. And I think that's probably it. So one of the sad things, and in fact, you know, um, I mentioned it in the slides of the, about political problems. There are a tremendous number of smaller problems that current visual machinery could probably solve or come close to solving where Either there aren't the people with the indoctrination because the area has grown so fast, there are still relatively few people who actually know how the stuff works, or the money that can be made by solving the problem just doesn't justify the efforts to solve it. So a constant feature of experimental science is you have pictures of things and you want to know which ones are special, right? That's basically detector technology. But it's not that easy to go out and mark up 100,000 examples and sling them into faster RCNN. And that means that somebody, the, the number of areas in which the discipline is contributing right now is smaller than it should be. There are lots of problems where we could probably solve them, but the cost of solving them with current methods is outweighed by the value. And that I think is sad because the solutions actually having those solutions would make a great deal of good, or would do a great deal of good. Okay, um, we have one more question from Mr. Divunri. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, on the lines of Reinforcement learning, uh, they're sort of like a reward that is, you know, uh, experimental again, which do not have like um, a set forth rules as to what our exact objective is to be achieved. But then if you look at the problem from an inverse reinforcement learning approach, then 
we are kind of like trying to mimic an expert action of sort, which could be the uh, human in the case where you know you are giving examples, sure. like um, uh, we do not we like focus on particular things which the uh, algorithms do not do. But I haven't seen like much research like which is in this nexus of like using inverse reinforcement learning and computer vision. What's your take on um, that? There is a little bit of inverse reinforcement learning in computer vision. There was a very nice paper in ECCV four or five years ago where um, they figured out, I'm trying to remember who was on it. It was Drew Bagnall and a couple of others. Uh, they figured out likely future paths of um, people who were walking using inverse reinforcement learning, right? So you, you can see somebody walking and then you ask, where are they going to be next in two seconds or five seconds? And you, you can come up with uh, inverse reinforcement learning solutions to that. Um, I believe there's a certain amount of inverse reinforcement learning that's been applied on sort of things like steering control Although I, I can't say I know very much about it. Um, I don't know if anyone is able to use it to force an interpretation of an image. Right? Yeah, so, that's what uh, yeah, I was I just, particularly I just, uh, interested in. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't seen anything. But do you think that's like a potential area to look into? Because that would essentially, you know, help in understanding how probably humans are making decisions and, uh, you know, making it into a structure that's um, also like understandable. Wow. Uh, you know, that, that's so strongly a question about taste. I want to be fairly cautious. Uh, um, it's not, uh, you know, I, 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 it's not a problem that would certainly engage my attention very much, but I think that's just a question of what I like. Um, the, I, I think the overwhelming problem in applications of computer vision right now is how do I know what kind of representation I need to recover such that what I do is very robust and very well behaved? And how can I ensure that when I recover that representation, nothing funny happens in the future? Um, I, you know, inverse reinforcement learning might be part of solving that problem, but I can't obviously see how. I, I, I would be inclined to attack it more directly. But again, it's a matter of taste. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Sure. So we have one last thing. Actually, it was my question. Javier asks if uh, you could explain more about the political problems. Oh, um, yeah, the political problems are sort of the obvious ones. Uh, um, the our conferences double in size every three years okay but right now i think the entire population in the united states will go to cvpr in uh, 2063 um and the entire population of china will go to prcv probably about 2071 or so the problem with that is it's really hard for new people to know how to get famous right you have a huge community and really an awful lot of stuff is just a fiddle or a diddle or a twiddle. And it's very difficult to get any kind of consensus about what the key aspirational problems are. Mm -hmm. The other problem is dissemination and indoctrination. There are a ton of applications. Like I mentioned, you know, there are all sorts of areas where great value could be created by knowing relatively simple computer vision tricks. There's some extremely funny thing on GitHub. Some guy had problems with a cat coming in the cat door. Uh, bringing dead animals with it. The cat liked to uh, kill things and then bring them home. And he built a little vision system that spotted whether the cat had a dead animal or not, and then locked the door shut if the cat had a dead animal. You do that for a couple of weeks and the cat stops because otherwise it sits outside in the rain. Um, counting stomata on plants, some kinds of medical screening. The, these are sort of situations where you probably don't need to be a major expert in vision or a, a deep researcher to get really tremendous value from being able to do these things, right? Uh, um, but we're not that great at, whoops, hang on, let me skip that. We're just not that great in, indoctr and in indoctrinating people 
in sort of the facts of vision. We don't really have an on-ramp for non-specialists. Uh, there are about 10 billion blog posts out there, but some of them are wrong, about half of them are wrong. So it's kind of hard to get into it. Uh, we, we need more effort in training. We need more statements of what's important and what the standard strategies are. Because I think for most of what the computer vision community does, there are a very large number of people who don't really care why they do it that way or what they do it. They just want to solve problems with it. And if they learn, they get enough information to do that, they're going to be happy. And we're not really that good at helping those people. And that I see as a, a significant problem scale. Okay, thanks, Professor Forsyth, for this amazing presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending uh, today's webinar. We have one more last Ken seminar coming up next week. And make sure to be there. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. This was great fun.